There's a moment when the sun disappears, when darkness falls and you're left with just your fears. That's the moment you feel your first pang of doubt. That's the moment when the night comes out. When the Night Comes Out presents Hellhound, Part 2. The monsters are still waiting, both human and perhaps not so much. With the horrific war going on around them, one group of soldiers in the heart of the First World War are about to find out how some corners never quite see the light when the night comes out. Command told us to come here to track down a French column of soldiers, Joseph said once they had poured the coffee. It was bitter and watery, but good, and from the U.S. soldiers' bags. Just like they sent you here to find us. One of our own planes saw them moving on this village. The place was bombed, but not quite this bad. We just trained the guns on this place and pounded it when we saw the soldiers heading here. Once things were tenderized enough, it was time to send us. There were fifty of us. Fifty? Bobby asked, sipping his coffee. How many French were here? There were just guesses, of course, but they thought it about the same amount. Not the full army? Bobby asked. Not from what our pilot said he saw, Joseph said. Anyway, we came just like you did. We set up a camp outside the perimeter and started watching. The sun went down and we had plans to enter the village in the morning, to start just before sunup. Joseph took another sip and his hand shook as he lifted the metal mug to his lips. Nerve shattered. Bobby thought to himself, but he remembered shaking just last night, too. We got ready in the morning. The night was fitful. We kept hearing things moving out in the darkness. We heard the howling, which came back last night, and I assumed you also heard. But this time it seemed distant. Our lookouts kept seeing things in the darkness, dashing around. To be honest, we were looking forward to coming into the village, hoping to get this mission over even if it meant facing off against French troops. I can understand, Bobby said. I wanted more than anything for this to be over last night. Did you see the creature? Joseph shook his head slowly. Not overnight, no. But just as the sky was lightening along the horizon, we got ready and packed up. Then we headed out slowly across the field you just ran across last night. We got maybe halfway when the creature revealed itself. There were teeth and red eyes. It moved so fast, took us entirely by surprise. The guy to the right of me was blown to pieces. I don't know if it was the teeth or the claws, but he was just in pieces all over the field. I raised my rifle, but it was too fast. Others managed to get a few shots off and hit nothing. The creature just moved from one to the next, and we started to run. Joseph shuddered at the thought. Bobby just let him gather his thoughts, let the man speak and remember. He cast a look over his left shoulder and saw Marty staring at the German, his eyes fixed on the man. The others sat down too, listening with rapt attention. All of them, Bobby imagined, were lost in their own memories. I don't know how I got here. But you see how many of us made it. Once we were inside the town proper, the wolf didn't come in. We've been here since. All we could do was stand at the edge of the town, looking out over the field at all the pieces of our companions. Eventually, even those were gone. Joseph looked even more pale when he said this. Bobby frowned. What happened to the pieces? It came back when the sun went down. 
and ate some. Jesus, Marty said. Plemons cleared his throat. So what are we doing? If it only comes out at night, we can just leave, right? I mean, shit, I don't want to fight you guys. I don't want to fight you guys in the damn trenches. Can't we all just leave? Joseph smiled a sad smile. I'm sorry, my new friend, but no. You see, yes, it comes back to patrols the area when the sun goes down. But if you try to cross over the border of the town into the field, it's summoned. Trust us, there were actually two more of us when we got here. We cannot leave. Bullshit, Plemons said. This sounds like a hun trick. I assure you it's not, Joseph said. You are welcome to try, but it has been nice knowing you for this short time, if you do. Sergeant, if you listen to this hun bastard, then you're a fool. This is all some goddamn trick to lure us in here. We need to go. Bobby looked at Plemons and then at Joseph. One looked resigned to his fate. The other looked scared. Do they honestly look like they're about to spring a trap, Plemons? Look at these men. They look exhausted, and there's only a few of them. Your sergeant is correct, Plemons. Joseph interjected. We are all that's left. We have no plans or means for an ambush. Look at us. Most of my men can barely stand, and none of us has weapons. The other soldiers shifted on their feet. Marty leaned close to Bobby's ear. Are you really buying this? Bobby sighed. After what we saw last night, how can you not? Marty shrugged. I don't know what I saw last night. I just know in the cold lot of day I'm tired, more than a little scared, and really just want to get out of here. Excuse me, my new friends. Joseph said. I hate to interrupt, but there is more you must know. Marty and Bobby stared at one another for a moment, then turned to look at the German. The others leaned in. The rest of the German soldiers just looked exhausted, haunted. We are not alone in this village, Joseph said, then sipped his coffee. Bobby blinked and shook his head. What do you mean? I mean what I said. We are not alone here. You mean the damn hellhound, right? Hellhound. That is a good name for it, but no, that is not what I mean. For days now, we have heard strange noises at night. Food and other possessions belonging to my compatriots have been vanishing. Then yesterday, Heinrich says he saw a little boy amongst the ruins. Bobby just stared at the German for a moment, as if unable to process what he had just said. He turned his head and looked at the other soldier Joseph was pointing at. Heinrich. The other German did not appear to be understanding what they were talking about, just held the same flat stare the other did. What did you just say? Bobby asked, finally. Did you say you've seen villagers here? Joseph shrugged. I don't know for certain they are villagers. I just know there appears to be others here, other people. This may explain why the dog doesn't come into the village. I'm not following, Bobby stated. Joseph stretched and waved his arms around in a general way, as if indicating the entire village, or perhaps the entire war. This is a part of the world where the villages and towns like this, or those who live here, believe in certain things. Things you Americans, I'm sure, have decided you no longer believe. Gypsies, for example, are often found wandering around here. But these people believe in magic. They believe in curses. Most importantly to our hellhound, they believe in monsters. He paused, looking sort of bemused. I guess I believe in them now, too. Bobby couldn't help himself. He smiled and then laughed. Joseph cracked a smile, and he started to laugh, too. A moment later, all the American soldiers were laughing. So, we have villagers here who summoned a demon dog to... what? Bobby asked when he had settled down. If it was to protect him from soldiers, it isn't working. All the fucking dog did was drive more of us into the village. 
This caused them all to laugh again. Then they paused to drink coffee. If you're serious, though, we should try to find him. I mean, I'm assuming you searched. Bobby said. Yes, of course, but the entire village seems entirely bombed out. Not a single building seems unaffected. I cannot imagine where they would be hiding. Bobby rubbed his chin. This was something he could focus on. If there were people here, they should find them. Maybe they would have some kind of explanation for what was going on here. Well, Joseph, my new friend, I say we combine our forces, Bobby said. Let's find where these villagers are hiding. Maybe they have information about our toothy friend out in the field there. Maybe they know how to stop him so we can get out of here. I mean, if they want to be left alone, I'm happy to leave and tell my superiors this is a town with no value. I agree, Joseph said and extended his mug. Bobby bumped it with his own, and then they drank. They met in what must have once been the village's main square. Bobby could almost see the grass, the flowers, perhaps the monument which stood in the center. Now it was all rubble and craters from shells which had fallen here. Where did Heinrich think he saw the boy? Bobby asked. Joseph turned to ask Heinrich a question in German. He says he's certain he saw the boy over there. Then he dashed behind that building in a pile of bricks. There were far too many places for someone to hide. Even more places for an ambush or a sniper. We must divide up, but just one street over. We'll go street by street and building by building. Be careful. This could all be a trap. Yeah, by them muttered Plemons. Enough, Bobby said. We'll head down this way. You guys head one street over. Joseph nodded, then conveyed the plan to his men. A moment later, they walked over one street. A moment after that, both teams were walking down the street. Eyes sharp, ears open, Bobby commanded. If a shadow moves, call out. They moved slowly while also being on edge. The air was still, silent, and Bobby could hear the footsteps and mutterings in German from the soldiers one street over. The sun was bright today, somehow piercing through the continuous smoke from the front. They entered the first building. It was quick to search since so little of it was left. Then they went to the next and the next. The heat grew and the men began to sweat. A few of them took off their helmets. By the time they reached the end of the street, Bobby had removed his, too. They moved like this throughout the morning. When the sun was high in the sky, they met back at the town square and ate more of their miserable food. The Germans looked completely wiped out. How are you guys holding up? Bobby asked. We are exhausted, Joseph said. The hound killed the man who carried much of our food when we ran across the field. We all had some, of course, but not enough. We've been rationing very carefully, but it's not enough. You will quickly notice there is no wildlife in here. Not even rats. I cannot even find bugs. You will need to watch your stores, too. I'm hoping we can find our way out of here, Bobby said. Maybe if there are people here, they know how to get past the dog. If there are people here, they'll have food, Marty interjected. They fell silent for a moment, eating slowly. Suddenly, Bobby felt like he was eating too much and put some of it away in his knapsack. His stomach protested, but he silenced it with more coffee. Hey. The shout caused all of them to jump. Phil stood at the perimeter of their half circle. He pointed and jumped up and down. Hey, look! Bobby grabbed his rifle and put on his helmet. The others did the same. The Germans followed suit. The group of soldiers moved toward Phil and stared down the street. At the far end, between two piles of what had once been buildings, stood a man. Blonde hair, fair skin. His clothes looked almost primitive, made from the skins of animals. He did not appear angry or afraid, in fact, he held both hands out in front of him as if to show to all he was not armed. 
Good afternoon, he said in an accent typical of the French from this part of the country. Please do not shoot those rifles. I mean you no harm. Who are you? Bobby commanded more than questioned. He still held his rifle up to his shoulder. Identify yourself. My name is Abraham, the man replied. If you want to be more formal, Abraham Luca, I live here. Nobody lives here, Plemons said. The man was twitchy, sweat poured down his face. Who are you, and what are you doing here? Well, since I'm standing here talking to you, and there's a beast out there destroying anyone who tries to get in, put the numbers together. I must live here already. Plemons looked as if he wanted to say something back, but he just turned red and shut up. Abraham, we have quite a few questions, Bobby said. We're all a bit confused. Can you help us? The blonde man shrugged. I was sent up here to offer our counsel. We figured you'd have those questions. We will do our best to answer them. Bobby felt a sudden pang of fear in his gut. How many of you are there? Abraham smiled. How many do you think once lived in this town? Now take away half thanks to bombs and soldiers like you. Then you have an idea. Bobby had no clue how many people lived in this town. No one had ever heard of this town until a few weeks ago. But it was way more than the combined group of soldiers. Of this, he was certain. Why should we trust you? Bobby asked. If you don't, you will die. Either by the hound or starving to death. If you do trust us, we can tell you how you might live a long and happy life. The choice is yours. Bobby looked around at the dirty, scared faces surrounding him. The Germans were the worst off. It seemed a good wind might knock them over. What do you say, Joseph? He asked. Is there a good way to die? If it's an ambush, at least it will be over with very fast. Bobby looked at Marty. Marty just gave his trademark shrug. He'd do whatever Bobby wanted him to do. We'll follow you, Abraham. Bobby called out. Some of the men looked relieved. We're trusting you. Abraham just smiled and nodded. He beckoned with one hand. Shall we? This is crazy, Plemons hissed. Probably a German trick. Does he seem German to you? Bobby asked. They're so slick, who knows? Geez, Sarge, let's just walk out of here. The fucking dog ain't out there now, and we're pissing around here. Let's see what happens, Bobby replied. Keep your gun ready, but don't shoot unless I give the order. Clear? Plemons nodded reluctantly. Bobby led the way, walking through the men and down the street. A moment later, the rest of them, including Plemons, followed. Overhead, the sun shone brightly. Miles away, on the front, another round of shelling started, rattling the earth and throwing up tons of dirt. No one in the village heard it. It was as if they were lost in time, or perhaps out of time, out of the war. They didn't walk far, just a little to the left, through a building, and then down a hidden trap door built into the floor. Beneath the door was a flight of stone steps. The walls of the stairs were lined with torches, a few of them burning deeper down where the darkness was thickest. Once they were down the steps, it was a long hallway carved into the rock. The shadows were intense, almost alive, as the flickering flames of the torches made the darkness grow and diminish. Bobby felt the world closing in around him, and there were times when the walls pressed against both shoulders. He could hear the men behind him breathing in the darkness. Up ahead, Abraham kept walking, never once turning back to see if the men continued to follow. He offered no comfort, nor did he offer any idea of how much further they had to go. Bobby felt his chest heaving and his heart hammered. He was going to lose it because now the ceiling was getting lower and lower. Just when he was certain he was going to lose his mind, the hallway suddenly opened up on both sides. 
To Bobby's surprise, there were people all around, perhaps as many as a hundred. The hallway ended in a large chamber carved into the rock. It went up over their heads and spread out on either side. There were alcoves chiseled away into the sides of the rock, and it appeared these were areas where people lived. Children ran around in a large, empty area in the middle of all the homes. The moment Abraham and the rest of the soldiers came into view, all of these people stopped what they were doing. Two children who had been chasing each other collided and fell in a heap. I told you I would bring them, Abraham said before anyone else could speak. Are you a madman? A woman asked just off to their right. Her eyes were wide and white in the shadows and flame. Are you mad bringing these killers in here? These are men, Abraham said. Why did we summon if not to make changes? Why did we summon if not to alter the way men look at each other? Look at them. Both sides working together. There has to be an end to it all. There has to be a purpose to what we do. If we summoned it just to kill, then we're no better than they are. We just kill us too. Bobby stepped forward. He was sweating and his heart was still tripping around inside his chest. It was like a frightened bird in a cage, struggling against the bars to get out. Ma'am, please, I understand you're afraid, but we're afraid too. I mean, we're just soldiers. I was sent here by my country. I'd rather be home with my family. None of us want to be here. The things which brought us here are politics and governments. And yet you have killed, haven't you? The woman asked. She appeared unimpressed. Regardless, since Abraham has seen fit to bring you here, then I guess we should welcome you. We do have food and water. Bobby held up a hand. Look, I appreciate it. We all do, and we'll take you up on it, but right now, what I want is someone to answer questions. Jesus, what the hell is that thing out there which killed most of our men? Abraham nodded as if anticipating this. I know you have questions. Your man can get food and water. You and your friends there, if he also wishes, can join me. Joseph returned the nod. I would be delighted to join. Can I come with you? Marty asked. Yes, any of you can. Abraham replied. The rest of you can go with Marta here and get some hot food. The other men seemed dubious at first. But then, more people appeared within the open area, some of them young women. This seemed to help break their concern over the situation, and soon they were being led away to an area within the tunnel where fires burned and the smell of cooking food filtered into the chamber. Bobby, Joseph, and Marty followed Abraham. They walked down another hall across from the open area. Here there were more homes and alcoves carved into the stone. Families sat in some of them, small fires burning to provide light. When was all of this built? Bobby asked. A very long time ago, Abraham said. We embrace the idea men would always find new and better ways to kill each other centuries ago. When men first showed up with gunpowder, then flintlock guns, we knew. We changed our way of doing things made preparations. We understood the technology would get more advanced, more destructive. What do you mean you embraced things? Bobby asked. Lucrece will be able to fill you in, Abraham stated. They continued for another few feet. They made a right turn and came to a stop at a large chamber at the end of a short hallway. The chamber was very brightly lit, and sitting within it was an ancient man dressed in white. When they came around the corner, he looked up from a piece of paper into which he was slowly writing and stared at them. The eyes were glossed over with what appeared to be cataracts. Hello, Abraham. You brought the soldiers with. Despite his very obvious age, he spoke with a young man's voice. There was power here and Bobby felt the hairs on the back of his neck and his arms raise up. Please, gentlemen, sit down, Lucrez said. 
The fire is warm, but these damp walls seem to seep into my bones these days. I know you have questions. Abraham stepped aside, and Bobby moved forward to sit down next to the old man. The man shifted a bit, and Bobby saw the parchment the old man had been writing on. It appeared to contain a language he had never seen before. In fact, it looked more like symbols and strange scratches which resembled no letters he had ever seen before. Joseph and Marty stepped into the chamber too and sat down. Marty held out a hand to the fire and rubbed his palms. Thank you for seeing us, sir, Bobby said. Abraham tells me you have answers for what's happening here. As you might imagine, we're quite frightened. The old man smiled, and it quite surprised Bobby to see he still had a mouthful of teeth. You need not be afraid, sir. Lucris said with a laugh. You just need to put down your arms, then kneel as the entrance to the town. Pledge that you will not fight anymore, for any government, forever. Then you will be able to walk out of here as if it is a fine summer's day. Bobby was baffled, and he turned his head to look at Marty. Marty had a half-smile on his face as if it amused him, as if this old man had just made a joke. I don't understand, Joseph said. I don't understand any of this. I know you do not. You do not understand the way the world really works. None of you do. We learned it the hard way when soldiers came to this area, before it was a village, before we even had writing. When they came and took women and slaughtered men, they slaughtered children. We turned away from this new religion these men tried to force on us. We returned to the old ways. Old ways from before even your ancestors would have been able to walk upright. Lucrest stood up then, and he was not broken nor bent. His face was wrinkled, and his body appeared thinner than a stick, but he stood upright. I know it confuses you. The old man continued. I know you have questions, because the old ways have been pushed into the dark, pushed aside. But there are things out there. Stronger, more powerful, than humans can imagine. They were gods once, but they are not really gods. Creatures like you and me and the wolf and the scorpion. Creatures from a time before they formed this earth. Before they created this universe and before they created time in a blast of heat and light. They existed in the void, the darkness, but they always watch. They will reply when beseeched. If the men say the right words, say the right things, write the correct sigils. If these things are done, the old gods, the ancient ones, will respond. They offer protection. He looked down at the surrounding men. Although his eyes were blocked by the cataracts, Bobby was sure he could see all of them. Not for the first time, he wondered just how old was this man. I was there when we turned back to our old ways. Lucrus continued, as if he could hear the question uttered in Bobby's brain. I was a boy, but I remember when the older men told me what they wanted to do. The beast they wanted to summon. The old man fell silent. He looked around at the men before him for a moment, as if taking them all in. Once more, Bobby got the sensation of the man seeing him without his eyes, seeing beyond the appearance of the men in front of him, far deeper. Perhaps, he thought, the price of his eyes was the cost of having the powers he so clearly demonstrated right before them all. Who or what did you summon? Bobby asked. The creatures we summon do not have names which you humans can understand. Lucrus responded. Then he spoke in words which sounded like a mixture of spitting and gurgling. He is summoned when war threatens. He takes the form of a wolf or a large dog and protects those who have brought him forth. Vet, vet, listen, Joseph said. I am not here to criticize your religion or beliefs, Lucrus. However, 
How is this dog protecting you? We here. We got in. Wouldn't it be better and more protection if the creature did not allow soldiers inside? Lucra smiled. Think about the encounters all of you had with the creature. Think about how fast it moved. It may appear to you like a dog or a wolf, but it's just the human brain which makes it appear such. Its true form is incomprehensible to the average human. Your brain simply creates something it can understand. How fast did it move? Like light itself, Bobby muttered. Yes, Lucrez affirmed. It is light, dark light. I bet you never knew such a thing existed. It has no actual form. By the time your mind puts together what it's seeing into something it can understand, it's already torn your guts out. I see, Joseph stated. It was quick. It seemed in all places at once. Sometimes one man appeared to just burst apart, like when hit with a mortar shell. Then, just as his blood settled to the ground, another man would burst apart. Yes. Lucrez nodded. So, think. Can you, a man, outrun night? There was silence in reply, but each man responded within their minds. Lucrez affirmed he heard them, even though none spoke. You cannot, can you? If you cannot outrun night, how could you outrun the beast? We couldn't, Marty replied, his voice little more than a whisper. There's no fucking way we could. You understand, Lucrez said. What are you saying? saying? Bobby and Joseph asked at the same time. It chose us, Marty said. We were allowed to live, don't you see? But why us? Joseph asked. We're just trapped here, Bobby said. Can you or your people leave? Lucrez shook his head. The creature has been summoned, and will not stop killing until the war stops. It's not about whether you can leave, but the fact you are more likely to choose peace. You are most likely to work together. But are we trapped here? Bobby asked, his concern rising. This makes no sense. How are we to stop the war if we cannot leave? And someone said if we lay down our arms, we could pass. But what would be within your hearts? Lucrez asked. Would you have put down your arms and forsaken the war? What would happen to you and your men when you left here? Would you be shot? You see, you come in here, and it senses you could be men of peace. Lay down your arms, so it will want to protect you. You are now under its care. But how can this stop the war? Joseph asked. Given the scale of the war, the beast, really an elder god, believes humanity will destroy itself. Lucrez replied. When humanity is destroyed, you will be able to restore peace. If enough like you come here, then enough will be done to restore peace and sanity to the world. This is madness, Joseph said. Yes, it is, Marty confirmed. It sounds to me like maybe you and the other summoned something which you cannot possibly control. Something terrifying, hoping to find protection. Perhaps, once it was here, it wasn't exactly what you wanted it to be. Lucrez's smile did not fade. I am not here to change your mind or convince you what we did was for noble purposes, I am also not here to convince you to stay, or that the creature will bide its time until the world is ready. What do you and your people intend to do? Bobby asked. Wait down here until the world above is gone? You act as if this world down here were not our native home. You act as if waiting down here is a chore. Have you any idea how old I am? How old my people are? We can wait down here for centuries. We embrace being a part of this earth and have no problem living down within it. Bobby stood up. 
I don't understand what you want from us. You can become one of us, Lucrest replied. All of you and your men, you can become one of us. The ritual is simple. You will learn the teachings and understand your purpose. There will be others. Others will come now, then later, then after. We will learn from them and bring them into our fold. Until, eventually, it will be our time. Lucrest bowed to them as if thanking them and sat back down. The soldiers waited another few moments, but there were no more speeches. Lucrest picked up his parchment and began to write, speaking in the strange tongue he had used when they first arrived and in which he recited the name of the beast. Come on, Bobby said with a disgusted sigh. I don't think the man has anything else to say to us. They all walked back into the hall. Abraham had apparently decided to leave as he was not there waiting for them. They heard voices in the distance, and Plemons' voice carried to them easily. The man did have a way of being obnoxious. It was his second nature. What do you think of this? Joseph asked. I think Marty has it right, Bobby said. These people turned to something dark and ancient, something they didn't fully understand. Now, something more deadly than guns is out there prowling around, and they don't know how to stop it. They moved into the town square again. The rest of the men were in various states of undress, having wounds tended to, and food was passed around. The men were content, but their faces looked haunted. Their eyes were distant, staring far off at something maybe a thousand miles away, even though there was no distance down in these tunnels. Men, gather up, Bobby said. The men stood rather reluctantly. For the first time, Bobby noticed just how many young, attractive women seemed to be part of this group. The men were seeking comfort from these ladies. Let's find a spot where we can talk in private, Bobby said. They stepped down a hallway opposite from the one they had just left. It was darker here, more sinister. They huddled around, and after Bobby did a quick check to see if they were alone, began to tell them all they had heard from the old man. Marty and Joseph filled in a few facts here and there, with Joseph translating it to German. As they went on and on, the men shifted on their feet nervously, anxious. When they were done, the soldiers stood in silence, and somehow the darkness seemed closer, crowding them. This is all madness. Clement said. This is some sick, sinister bullshit. Pagan nonsense. But you saw what it was, Bobby insisted. You saw it attacking our men. Saw them torn to pieces as they ran. I don't know what I saw, Clement said defensively. I saw men being torn apart, as you say, or maybe blown apart. What if these pagan bastards lure people like us into their village to kill and steal from? They create hallucinations with a gas, or they create something which appears to frighten men like us as a giant dog. Flush them out into a field lined with mines. But we heard no explosions, Plemons, Marty said dismissively. We would have heard them go off, plus why are we the ones which got through? Then something else, Plemons said. We've heard the Germans are working on a silenced weapon. We've seen what machine guns can do to people. What if they've developed some kind of, I don't know, silenced machine gun? You're grasping at straws, Bobby said. So what do we do then? Phil asked. Do we just stay here forever? Get old like the old man? Sorry, sir, but the last thing I want to do is stay here, living underground. <sighs> I, I don't know, Bobby said. Did I say I have all the ideas here? I'm open to suggestions, but Plemons, there is something out there. I don't know about ancient gods or heathen rituals, but I know what I saw with my own eyes. I saw it tower over me with teeth and red eyes. I saw it moving. 
I had someone's guts all over me and in my lap. Something is out there and we have to figure out what to do. They stared at one another for a moment. Then Plemons made an odd snorting sound with his mouth and nose, turned around, and headed back towards the hallway they had come through to get here. Plemons, where do you think you're going? Bobby asked. I'm going to show you this is all bullshit, Plemons said. This is all flim-flim. I wouldn't be surprised if none of this were real. Just hallucinations they've implanted into our brains with some kind of weird gas or something. Plemons walked past the men and back up the hallway. Two other of Bobby's men stared at him for a moment, then followed Plemons back up the hall. Joseph sighed. Bobby shook his head. Your men? said a voice from the shadows. Had better be stopped, because you are correct, sir. All the remaining men turned around at the sound. From within the shadows emerged a tall, thin woman with wide eyes. She had dark hair, her eyes glowed green in the dim light from down the tunnel. Her ears were nearly pointed, and the dark hair was wound around her head in an elaborate series of braids. Who are you? Bobby asked. How long have you been there? Long enough to hear you in understand what you were told by the old man. My name is Prudence. I was born here, and you were correct in your assessment. What do you mean? Bobby asked urgently. We have to discuss this later, Prudence said. We must stop your men. If we do not, they will be killed. We can talk after. Bobby's head spun with thoughts he could barely understand, but he knew she was right. Every instinct inside of him said Plemons and the other two who followed him were in danger. Without another word, he ran after the three soldiers. Plemons, get back here! He called, his voice echoing down the chamber filled with villagers. Plemons, that's an order! There was no response. Plemons heard footsteps behind him, but didn't pause to see who was following. He turned right and followed the narrow path they had taken to get here, nearly bashing his head into the low ceiling at one point. He could hear the men up ahead talking quickly to each other. Plemons! Bobby called. Stop right this minute! That's an order! There was no response. It seemed like an eternity before they came back out into the sunlight. Bobby was surprised to see the sun was lower in the sky than he had assumed it would be. The shadows were longer. Late in the afternoon, with plenty of sun left, but not the midday sun they had when they went underground. He saw Plemons and the other two just ahead. Plemons, stop right now! Plemons looked back at him, but waved his hand dismissively and kept walking. Bobby removed his revolver, stopped, got into his stance, aimed, and fired a shot into the ground ahead of the three men. All three froze. I said stop! Plemons whirled around, his face a mask of anger. Are you mad? Have all of you gone mad? He froze mid-sentence. Who's this with you now? Plemons cried, gesturing to someone behind Bobby. It was only then he realized Prudence had followed them. Never mind, Bobby said. Where do you think you're going? We've had enough of this nonsense, Plemons said, sweat beaded on his upper lip, his eyes bright and nervous in his skull. I'm not sitting here listening to more of this pagan bull. You saw what happened, man, Bobby implored. I'm telling you as the senior member of the group to stand down. Get back in line with the men. We're going to work together to find a solution. What solution? Plemons hissed. The other two men with him stood behind him, looking less certain than their erstwhile leader. The solution is staying here? Of course not, Bobby retorted. We're going to figure out a way to leave. We're going to figure out a way to stop the thing out there. There's nothing out there we haven't seen before, Plemons said. 
Bobby realized the man had become unhinged, and he understood there would be no turning him back now. It's all bullshit. Nonsense. You see how late it is out here? Look at the sun. How long were we in there? It felt like maybe 20 minutes. How is the sun this low in the sky? Sarge, they're poisoning us or hypnotizing us or some other gypsy bullshit. I know you think it's just mines or machine guns, but it's not. Bobby said. I saw the thing, Plemons. I'm telling you, I looked it in the eyes. Plemons' face cracked a bit, the mask of cockiness and assuredness, and he looked like he was going to scream or tear his hair out. And you were one of the magically chosen ones, huh? You're somehow the hope of humanity? You and these fucking Huns? You want me to believe that? You made it too, Bobby said. Means you're chosen, just like me. Plemons stepped back as if Bobby had struck him. No, he said at last. Now, don't try that bullshit with me. We're going to the opposite side of the town from the one where we ran in. The three of us, we're going to head out and cross the field there. We'll get to the tree line and signal back. Show you it's all nonsense. You should listen to your commander, Prudence intoned. He doesn't understand what's happening, but he knows you'll die. I'm sorry, but who the hell are you, lady? Who the hell are you, and why should I listen? Plemons stared hard at the young woman, challenging her to speak up. Prudence did not appear intimidated, but she didn't say anything more. Plemons turned his ire back towards Bobby. Am I going to get any problems from you, Sarge? You going to shoot me? Bobby found he didn't have the strength to keep fighting this fight. He knew in the depth of his own gut he was right. Plemons and the other two would be dead soon, but what did it matter when hundreds were dying by the scores now? Mowed down in muddy fields, or blown to pieces in dirty trenches, or devoured by a pagan god resembling a wolf, what did it matter? Would trying to stop him make a difference? Shooting him sure wouldn't. Plemons was scared. He didn't want to believe, and putting a gun in his face wouldn't make him believe. Maybe the man even wanted to die. It was hard to blame him. I won't stop you. I won't shoot you either. But you're a goddamn fool, Plemons. You'll get yourself killed along with these two. But I won't stop you. Plemons seemed almost shocked by the statement, blinking at him like a lost dog for a moment. Then he realized the other two were looking at him, so we straightened up. Fine. Good. Look, when we get across the field, you'll see. You'll follow. We'll report back. There's nothing here. Do what we can to leave these people alone. A shadow of fear crossed his face. I want nothing more to do with this place. With his words finished, he saluted, then turned on his heel and walked down the street. His two acolytes followed. Bobby sighed and ran his hands through his sweaty hair. Christ. He muttered. What's gonna happen to them? They will be killed. Prudence said, coming towards Bobby with her strange, wide eyes. They will be destroyed by the beast. Jesus, what are we going to do, Bobby? Marty asked, his face bright and alert. I guess we'd go watch and see what happens. Bobby sighed with a voice full of exhaustion and resignation. What else can we do? He's right. What good would it do to shoot him? They'd be dead regardless. Bobby shrugged and put his head down, not wanting to look at the rest of the men or the shocked, saddened look in Marty's face. He followed Plemons and the other two soldiers, keeping his distance, but always keeping them in sight. It wasn't long before they were at the far edge of the town, a side opposite from the one they had entered. Why this way? Bobby asked when they arrived. If we came in the other side, we already know where people were attacked, right? Plemons' eyes were vibrating in his skull. The more likely route for someone to come in here is the side we came in on. They couldn't have mined the entire area around the town. They can't. It made no sense to Bobby but he could tell Plemons had been pushed too far, seen too much. 
the man had been over the top in the trenches at least two dozen times before he was chosen for this insane mission. How many men had he seen blown apart in front of him? Countless dozens. This situation had finally pushed the insanity button within his mind, and he was gone. Nothing he did made much sense except to him, but he was somehow charismatic enough to attract two more. Bobby nodded as if what he had said made sense. This seemed to confirm to Plemons to continue. He turned and spoke quietly to the two men with him. Bobby turned his head away, unsure if he could keep watching this. He saw the rest of the men, American and German, had filled in behind him to watch. They all looked terrified and saddened. How many horrors had they all seen in this war, and yet this one, seeing three men going to their death, had struck them to the core. Plemons and the men secured what gear they had. They no longer held guns, which Bobby found intriguing. With one more look over his shoulder, Plemons looked as if he might want to say something else, then thought better of it. The three of them stepped in a line and walked past the edge of the town, past the rubble of the stone wall around this town. Bobby edged closer now. His heart pounded in his chest and he thought it might just burst through onto the dirty ground. The rest of the men followed suit. The three soldiers were soon two feet, then five feet, then ten feet out into the field. There was no sound. No sounds of shelling or distant gunfire from the front. No birds. Bobby thought immediately of the quiet the night they had arrived. The three soldiers appeared as surprised as everyone else. Plemons turned his head around to gaze back the way he had come. A hint of a smile crossed his face. Fifteen feet. Twenty feet. They were getting more casual, maybe a little cocky now. The three soldiers started to move a little faster. One of them whispered something, and the other two laughed. Is it getting darker? It's coming. Bobby looked around, and it was definitely less bright. As if the shadows from miles around had congregated here, and were now also trying to leave the village. The sky grew more dim, and the shadows around them began to move. 35 feet. 37. The shadows coalesced into one large shadow which slid across the broken ground toward the three soldiers. Run! Bobby hadn't even realized he was the one who shouted until Marty looked back at him in surprise. The large shadow passed over the three soldiers. They stopped cold their hands away from their sides. All three looked around as they were suddenly enveloped in darkness. Then, the darkness pooled about five to ten feet in front of them. The shadows contracted, grew tighter, then expanded upward. As the shadow grew from the ground, it became solid. Moments later, features appeared. Fur. Paws. Claws. Oh, my sweet Jesus Christ, Marty whispered. Joseph muttered something in German. The first thing Bobby noticed within the shadow were the red eyes, bright, piercing through the sudden darkness. Then the mouth opened and what appeared to be row upon row of teeth were visible. The rest of the shape formed, ears and snout and paws. A massive black dog at least ten feet high stood there, growling at the three men. Oh my god! Clemens and the other two soldiers did their best. They tried to run around the huge beast, dodging to the right, but there was never any doubt. The beast moved as if made of light. One moment it was there, fully formed and solid, then it was smoke, then it was all around the men. The soldier on the far right stopped running so quickly, it took Bobby a moment to realize the man's head had been taken off cleanly at the neck. Blood spouted from the savaged and severed blood vessels. Just as the body started to fall, the shadow moved again, followed by a sickening crunch, and the top half of the man's body was bitten in half. <laughs> 
Bobby whispered in a kind of silent prayer he was certain would not be heard. He wanted to tear his gaze away, but found himself unable to move, unable to do anything but watch. The intestines from the man bitten in half erupted from the bottom half of his body like tentacles. Then the shadow moved again, and even the bottom half was gone. All of this happened in mere fractions of a second, too fast for the eye to follow. By the time the horror of the image registered, the shadow would cross again, and something new would take its place. Plemons, run, goddammit! Marty cried. Get back here! Plemons appeared frozen, his mouth agape, staring at the spot where his fellow soldier had been until seconds ago. Now there were just particles of unidentifiable meat and blood where a man once stood. He made odd sounds from his throat, his eyes so wide his eyeballs looked like they might just fall out of his skull and roll in the dirt. The soldier next to Plemons suffered no such paralysis. Having seen enough, he cried out and did an about-face attempt to run back the way he had come. The wolf creature didn't give him the chance to take more than two steps before the shadow crossed in front of him. The soldier's head was gone in a flash, so fast his body took three more steps before falling over on its side. A moment later, the remains were gone too, leaving behind bloodstains and little else. This was enough for Plemons. He tried to run too, the desire to flee overwhelming. His eyes were so wide, filled with pure animal terror. Bobby felt an icy hand clutch at his heart, realizing he was watching a doomed man. The shadow appeared directly in front of Plemons in an instant, the dog stretching to its full height. Bobby and the men in the village could no longer see anything more than Plemons' feet through the legs of the towering beast. They could hear the man scream, however. The scream did not last long, just a few seconds, then the hideous sound of bones crunching and a weird, wet sound of flesh rending. The creature let Plemons' body fall to the ground as it turned to face the men at the edge of the village. The upper half of their compatriot's body hung, bleeding and dripping from its mouth. Its teeth bared and a growl which shook the ground emanated from the beast. Its skin, such as it was, rippled and changed, and within it, Bobby would swear he could see faces. The faces of other men it had devoured? He didn't know and did not want to know, but he could see them nonetheless, roiling and turning within what would have been a normal dog's fur. Faces filled with terror and horror beyond imagination. The red eyes pierced their own, nailing them to the spot, but also marking them. It knew them and what their purpose was. They were to stay here, away from man's war. Then, just as quickly as it had appeared, the beast vanished. The shadows which had created it dispersed, and the entire area grew lighter. All which remained in front of them was the bottom half of Plemons' body, spilling the last of its blood into the dust. Bobby turned away, his stomach churning. He forced himself to calm down, swallowed what was trying to come up. Whatever food was in there, he needed to keep it. When he felt stable, he pointed a finger at Prudence. I think we need to talk, he whispered. And we'll hear that conversation next time. Stay strong. Stay safe. And remember, even during war, nightmares lurk when the night comes out. You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, a weekly horror anthology podcast with stories by Brian W. Alaspa and narrated by Ali James. Music by Kevin MacLeod and Vivek Abishek. For Brian's work, visit his website at brianwalaspa.com or visit amazon.com for his books of fiction and nonfiction. Be sure to listen to Ali's work on Facebook at Ali James Projects. 
Visit our website at whenthenightcomesout.com to learn how to support us on Patreon.